consulted scripture and found all the reasons not to take scripture literally, uh, found reasons not to hate homosexuals in the Bible, found reasons uh, not to believe that Jesus is coming back and that, and that biblical prophecy is, is valid. Um, this is not what you get from reading the Bible closely. You get this from relinquishing your religious faith on many points. I mean, you, you, you continually, as a moderate, have to acknowledge that there are questions science is better at answering, and the, and the list of those questions continues to grow. I mean, so, so religion continues to lose ground to science and to, and to secular ethical discourse generally, uh, and moderates aren't very candid about what process is really delivering their moderation. Uh, and because of that, they, they, they promulgate this kind of fantasy that, uh, you know, Christianity is really just about helping the poor and building community and, and uh, turning the other cheek, and Islam is really just about charity and, you know, ennobling people, and it's just this vast egalitarian attitude. It's great that this is what Christianity and Islam are for some people, but for, for many, many millions of people uh, on both sides, these religions are something else entirely, and moderates tend to, to obscure that fact uh, with their apologetics uh, rather than stand in criticism of it as they should. You just said that we need to find some way of moderating fundamentalism, and you're not really seeing religious liberals as allies in finding some way of getting there. I want to talk about the way that you're trying to get there. You've called Letter to a Christian Nation a broadside, an attack. We've been talking about your attack against Christianity. Do you think attacking Christianity is the best way to denude it, to gut it, to make it less offensive, problematic? Isn't it possible that all these attacks, uh, it seems like this fall, this winter, is the time more than any time before when people are having the courage of their convictions writing books against religion do you think that maybe all these attacks will only increase the shrill and divisive tone of the dialogue about religion rather than finding solutions to these problems well i think there's there's some element of that and and i would be the first to acknowledge that there are different roles to be played here I mean, there, there are different voices that are necessary and i don't think everyone will or can or should talk about religion the way I talk about religion. You know, I don't think it would be a good idea, for instance, if we had political leaders who spoke about Islam precisely in the terms that I speak about Islam. I think that would be so inflammatory uh, and would just immediately start getting people killed. Uh, and, and so that's, you know, that would not be a good thing. Right. You might have agreed with the Pope and what he said about Islam, but you didn't like that the Pope said it. Yeah, you know, I think it was a bad idea. I, you know, it was a bad idea compounded with other bad ideas. I mean, he he shouldn't have said it the way he did, and uh, having said it, he shouldn't have apologized the way he did. I mean, basically the worst possible case. But we just we have to be clear about what is going on in this world, and we have to be clear about the way in which religious ideas are causing conflict, causing people to rationalize the violent deaths of their children causing people to seek their own deaths, uh, specifically in the Muslim world, uh, in martyrdom. I mean, these beliefs really are operative, and they really have to be undercut, and there's really nothing good about them, and there's nothing to respect about them. And, and so we have a war of ideas we have to wage, and failing that, we have wars we have to wage. And so, I mean, to speak specifically about Islam, we have to find some way for the moderate Muslims to really fight a war of ideas with their co-religionists, and if not that, a civil war with their co-religionists, because there's just no question that we are at war with people who think that cartoonists need to be killed for caricaturing the prophet. So any moderate, so-called moderate Muslim, who is taking the other side in that debate, who's saying, no, no, you really shouldn't draw cartoons of the prophet because it is deeply offensive and free speech has to lose this particular uh, tug-of-war, that person's not as moderate as he should be. So to go back to your question, one way I see this attack bearing fruit is if people like me are attacking religion in a very vocal and strident and uncompromising way, it can motivate people who are not ready to do that, uh, moderates and, and religious liberals, to at least take a, a firm stand on specific issues where they're not presently taking a firm stand. I mean, to, to take the cartoon controversy as... One example. I mean, it was appalling 
that virtually no paper in in this country, apart from Free Inquiry, published those cartoons. I mean, they, they, they were newsworthy in how benign they were. I mean, the fact that that crowds by the hundreds of thousands were massing, calling for the deaths of cartoonists and newspaper editors in response to these drawings, which were fundamentally benign, that was newsworthy. And every paper in the United States should have published those cartoons. To the contrary, we had... Uh, papers like the New York Times chastising Denmark for their religious insensitivity. Right. That is that is a disastrous capitulation to the religious lunacy of the mob in the Muslim world. And you know, it's the same kind of capitulation that the Pope is now making by apologizing. Um, we have to just draw a very clear line between the sane rules of civil discourse and this religious lunacy that prevents discourse. And in some sense, I view people like myself and, and Richard Dawkins, who has a new book out, in taking the very hard line we're taking, uh, we're not imagining that all of a sudden everyone is going to speak the way we're speaking, but we're imagining that parts of our criticism uh, could become compelling enough so that on specific issues of social policy and specific moments in this war of ideas, vast numbers of people could change their approach. So that I think we really should hope for. So you're saying that by being uncompromising in your attacks on religion, you're giving space for other people who might not be as uncompromising, at least to themselves, become more vocal. Yeah, yeah, I think that is definitely part of the dynamic, as I see it. Last question, Sam. You talk about this clash of cultures, this culture war between the seculars and the religious, the rationalists and the supernaturalists, as uh, one of the greatest challenges we face in the 21st century. How can our listeners, if they're religious or not religious, wherever they are on the spectrum, but if they want to meet that challenge, what can they specifically do? Well, it, it really comes down to changing the rules of conversation. I just think that, you know, I, I'm very short on programmatic recommendations. I'm not talking about laws that we, we need written or uh, specific activities. I think it's, it's much more amorphous than that. It's, it's like... You know, how do you get rid of racism? Well, there, there, was, there was some uh, legislation involved, but I think the bigger picture and the, and the really, you know, the necessary and sufficient change was just to get people thinking differently, talking differently, creating different art and entertainment, I mean, portraying racism and racists and people of different races differently in in movies and uh, literature, I mean, the, the complexion of the conversation has to change. And so, I, you know, I think making bogus religious certainty look foolish from a thousand different angles in culture is what is going to transform our culture. Uh, and the corresponding contribution also has to be made that we have to we have to offer rational and satisfying alternatives to bogus religious certainty. And we have to talk about ethics uh, in a, uh, a compelling and rich way uh, that is scientifically justifiable. And I mean, that, that is beginning to happen more and more. But we, ha- we have to paint very stark contrasts in our, in our public conversation between legitimate claims to, to certainty and legitimate science, uh, real ethics that takes as its object uh, human suffering, uh, and all of the the medievalisms that are still ascendant, you know, the, you know, the, the fact that that Christians, for instance, can debate gay marriage as though it were the greatest problem facing civilization. I mean, that has to be lampooned and criticized and eroded from a hundred sides. Uh, I mean, it has to be depicted at, at the very least as a colossal waste of time. Uh, and yet, we, we're not successful in doing that because we're not successful in undercutting the religious certainties that are providing the moorings for this this dialogue. So I, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a matter of conversation, and it's a matter of what is considered politic to say publicly, and uh, you know, the, I just think the rules of discourse have to, have to be revised. Thank you very much for joining me on Point of Inquiry, Sam. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, DJ. You've seen the headlines. Bill seeks to protect students from liberal bias. 